Family feud. The idea of all of our families, we all have some forms of dysfunction. And even when you look at the families, you can also look at a church because it is a church family. In any family, there would be some forms of dysfunction. That dysfunction that we have is brought out when many people get together. Whether it's at your house, it may be at Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas, there could be that one person, that person that comes to the house that just irritates you. That is probably a nice person, but causes dysfunction within the setting of the home. We all have that in our regular homes. We all have that in a church environment. There are all kinds of dysfunctions. When you look at what dysfunction truly is, truly dysfunction is, I just really am not getting my way. I can't handle the way life is going, so I'm going to cause a problem. The definition of dysfunction is defined relating badly characterized by the inability to function emotionally or as a social unit. It also is said not performing as expected or failing to perform an expected function. Whenever we look at dysfunction, we have to come up with whether it's a team or whether it's a family. What we have to do is what can we do in order to fix the problems within our family or within a team or you could even say within your business. There are some foundational building blocks. But before we talk about what we do to build, what we first have to do is, what does God say about us? God used uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 to communicate something that's very important. He says, he says, the local body, the church, needs to be somewhat different than any other organization. Because if the church isn't any different than other organizations, God is not in the center of the church. You could look at any business, or you could look at any uh, church. The common denominator between the church is God's Holy Spirit that lives within your life. If the church and the business model, if there's no difference between the church and a business model. They look at the church and they see dysfunction within the church. Not because God is in charge, it's because it's ran by man. But the church has to be led by God, the center of it. In Ephesians chapter 4, he says there's one common denominator that the church has to have, and that spirit is unity. You know that we have unity. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses, let's look at 1 through 6 or so. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead your life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit. Just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father who is over all and in all and living through all. There's one God. And if we as the church, if we put our focus on anything other than God, we need to look at each other as a family. A family. Even though families sometimes feud, they are a family. I had four brothers growing up, okay? And they would beat me up. They would just, I was the baby of all, they would just beat me up. But you know what happens if somebody else tried to beat me up? Right? You're going to come to the rescue. You're going to come up and you're going to stand and you're going to fight. You're going to protect. And that's what families do. We may fight and argue, but what we are is we are one family. We need to look at the body of Christ as a unit that's going to serve and love each other. Now, in your bulletins, you have a, a, a paradigm. You have some pillars. We're going to start on the bottom, and we're going to work our way up because these pillars are very important for the foundation of strength. How do we deal with some of our dysfunctions? Now, I'm going to look at it as a negative, and I'm going to talk to you about the positive. We're going to look at it as a negative and look to the positive. The first one is trust. If you lose trust, you lose everything, right? You look at any relationship, any family. When you lose trust, 
you lose everything. What happens when you are not trustworthy? That means you can't be honest and say, I was wrong. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. Whenever you have a family unit and you have somebody say, man, I really messed that one up. I, I didn't, I shouldn't have, I'm sorry. What happens to the family unit? You may have a disagreement at the moment, but what happens, you gain trust because you're gaining honesty. And in a church setting, we have to have the trust of the body of Christ to say, we are here, we love God, and we're going to enter into this relationship or into this family with trust. We are going to look and we're going to evaluate, and we're going to trust. What happens if they do not? They conceal their weaknesses and their mistakes. And this is what the problem with many churches is we bring in the facade of life into the church place. And by perception, while well, we are thinking that we have to be perfect, or we want everybody to think that we are perfect, in reality, what we are is we are a bunch of broken individuals that have dysfunctional lives that need Jesus Christ as the head of our home. That's what happens. But if we do not have trust in God, we don't have trust in other people, we hesitate to look and to have feedback. We're afraid of what they will say later. We're afraid of what could happen. So what we have is we just hesitate to ask for help. We hesitate to say, you know, I need somebody to pray for me. I had somebody in the back hallway just, just earlier today said, said Bruce, my, my blood counts are shot out of the roof and I'm kind of scary. I've, I've fought cancer twice, and I'm really afraid for this third time. He, he, you could see the fear in his eyes. So I, I just prayed with him. You know, there's some times where you don't have to deal with things by yourself. But if you're afraid of trust, what happens, you play the game, and you put the facade on, and you just say, you know what, I'm okay. In all realities, we're not. And another thing, if we don't have trust, we don't offer help to people outside of their own responsibilities, their own ministries. If we don't trust what other people are doing, then we can just say, they do their thing and I'll just do my thing. Because if we have trust within the body, within the family, what we do is, what does it take for the church to be successful? We have to look at other areas. We have to honor other people. And what happens is we waste time and energy managing our behavior effects. In other words, Image is everything if we do not have trust because we're not open. And what happens, eventually, it turns into bitterness. Somebody doesn't like me or somebody doesn't like what I'm doing. I don't trust them for what they're going to say. I don't have confidence in them. The first tier of any relationship in any church or any business, if we do not have trust, we do not have the foundation to build a solid congregation. Trust is everything. The second thing is hard. The second thing is conflict. Conflict. In any relationship, and in any church, or in any team, there has to be conflict. Now, we don't like conflict, but there, have, there has to be conflict. We all have different temperaments, and we all have different personalities. We all have different styles. We all have different thought problems. So what happens is if we do not have conflict, now conflict is not a mad issue. Conflict is I'm not going to stand in my way and you're going to stand in your way and we're going to butt heads. That's, that's a fight. A conflict is I'm going to come into a meeting or I'm going to come into a church and I'm going to look at this. How can I do something? How can I serve? How can I love? I may not like everything about it, but what I must do is I must have conflict and deal with those things. But if somebody walks into a meeting or walks into a church and they are just mad, they're mad at the world and they're just looking for conflict, what happens? It brings artificial harmony. Artificial harmony. Whenever we have artificial harmony, we may be happy on the outside, but we are mad on the inside. We may be able to smile to your face, but we're going to talk behind your back. And any time that we have artificial harmony, that we cannot deal with our conflict, teams or the churches should be able to be creative without worrying about hurting somebody's feelings. We, we had a new members class today, and, and one of the things that they talked about in the new members class was, was music. 
And so they, were, they came from a church uh, where, you know, they started the praise band, and, and it took forever to get the drums on the platform. And guess what? That was a conflict. So the conflict, no, we don't have drums. We can have the, we can have the bass, and so we can have the keyboard, but that drum, that, that, that's, that's, that's a sin. So it causes conflict. And sometimes they may deal with it. They deal with it wrongly sometimes. But what we must be able to do is have a meeting or have a church or have a team that says, I can share my feelings, my concerns, and my issues without hurting you. Without hurting you. If we have the spirit of humility and peace and unity, we can have a church or we can have a family that we can share our hurts and our disagreements and we can have conflict without hurting the person's hurting their emotions. So what happens if we don't have conflict is we ignore controversial topics that are critical to the church's success. We avoid it. We stick our head in the sand. Sometimes what we must do is we must communicate the truth with peace and love at all times. If a church, a leader, or a, or a family will not and cannot communicate truth and stick their head in the sand, what happens is we have just wasted away to a club and not have the power of God. We also fail to tap into opinions and perspectives of teams and churches. We fail to tap into the perspective. Because what happens is, as the church grows, as the church moves and, and is molded and it's pliable, what happens is the older generation sometimes pass off the scene and the younger generation are coming on the scene. We can't have a church that we had a church 50 years ago for today. What happens is the church is pliable. So what happens when somebody moves in and somebody comes to the church and somebody gets saved and somebody's part of the church, whether you're a member of the church for 60 years or you're a member of the church for one week, you're important. It's pliable. And what we must do is we must identify, grab a hold of, keep a hold of every person that walks through these doors. My friend, and he's been here many times, his, his name is Dr. Gary Pinion, and he stated in his book, if every church is like this church, why do we have this church? If every church on this block is identical to this church, why does this church even exist? Why don't we come along and just go to a different church? But God brought all of us to this point for this particular time for your gifts, my gifts, and our ministry to thrive. It will have conflict. There will be times that we will butt heads. There will be times that you're going to think, I'm preaching to you. There's going to be times that I have to say, I am sorry. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have stated that. I have made a mistake. There's going to be times that you may have to say, you know what, Bruce, I'm sorry. There may be times I have to say, you know what, I wish you would help me out here. We must be able to deal with our conflicts. All teams or churches are made up with unique, gifted people. The job of the coach or the leader is to get them to realize it, put up the right time to get involved with the right place, and to serve in the right reason. You have to conflict. I may have to say, I need your help. I need something. Because if we do not have trust, and we do not deal with conflict, we will never have the third pillar, and that's commitment. Commitment. Churches die without commitment. Would you say your family would die without commitment? Commitment is paramount. You're going to have arguments. There's going to be problems. But what we must do is we must be committed. We have to be committed to each other at all times. And if we are not, what we do is we fail. So, so the commitment. Creative, when we're uncertain in our commitment, what happens is we, we lack our creativity to grow the church. Membership of a team means more than just watching the team on the sideline. It means I am committed, I'm going to get involved, and I'm going to do what is need to be done. New church members are invited to participate in every level. When you're part of this church, what we must do is we must say, what can we do? Not where can I sit? Not where is my chair? It's what in the world can I do? How can I get involved? How can I be committed to God's work? Ideas discussed. 
Ideas discussed should be followed through and agreed upon. When we are committed, this is what we're going to do. We, we've made all kinds of mistakes over the last two or three years in the ebb and flow of this church. Whether we're going to do two services or we're going to go to one service or we're going to take the offerings at the beginning of the service, we're going to take the offerings at the end of the service. We, we, you know, we're trying anything. We're trying anything. What we want to do is we want to make sure that what we are doing is successful. And you know what? Some of you say, I hate that. I don't like the chair set this way. I want straight lines. I want this or I want the point. You know, we can't make everyone happy. What we're trying to do is we're trying to honor God. And if we take the offerings at the first or at the end, if we make straight chairs or bench chairs, if we take two services or one service, if we have small groups or if we have cell groups or we have Sunday school, you know what? It takes a commitment to the body of Christ. I don't care what necessarily the chair said or what time we do church. What I do is I want to honor God. And I want to be committed to the church that I love. And when we have that, what God can do is great and mighty things. Well, when we don't, when we're not committed, here's what takes place. The windows of opportunity close very rapidly. Because if we're not committed, what happens is that change of lack of commitment changes our attitude. And if we get upset over a thing, we don't like anything. Let me say that again. Somebody give me an amen if you agree. If you get mad at one thing, sooner or later you're going to be mad at everything. And when you get mad, what happens if we are a family, if we are a family, we may have a feud, but we are family. And what we must do is we must discuss, we must talk, we must share. What do we need to do to fix? If it's my opinion, okay. But if it is fact, if it is doctrine, we need to stand up for the right thing. What happens um, when we have lack of commitment? We have lack of confidence and we fear failure. So what happens is when we are lack of commitment and we feel fear we fear failure is what we do is we leave. Family deals with issues. A family that will not deal with issues at the highest level is totally dysfunctional and will never make it through a disaster. But families, churches that are full of commitment, when they say, you know what, I'm going to make a joke here because church starts at 1030, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to be there at 1029. I mean, that's 20 minutes earlier than most of you get here, so I'm going to be here at 1029. <laughs> that's true. Somebody give me an amen if you're on the platform. You see that? Okay. What we have to do is members and leaders have anxiety for making things very successful. I want to have a high commitment. I want, I want to have an anxiety. I want to, I want, when somebody said, my friend brought me to church or my brother brought me to church, you know one of the greatest things is when you bring somebody to the body of Christ and they get saved and they get part of the church and you brought them to the body of Christ, you're, you're hoping the preacher preaches a good message. You're hoping the game show works. You're hoping the music is awesome. You're hoping people hit the altar because you're excited because God is using you. You don't want the, the sermon to be on tithing. You don't want the music to be 30 minutes long. You don't want Steve Hoover to sing and to be the worst song you've ever heard. You want everything to be great. You want it to be good. What happens is we have to look at what commitment truly is. And then the second pillar, second pillar is accountability. We have to be accountable. That means when we do things, I am not the sin police of Glenville. I am not going into your house and tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're not doing wrong. That's not my job. My job as a pastor is to communicate the truth of God's word. We have one person that lives within every one of us and that is the Holy Spirit of God. And when we are accountable to God and when we preach the word of God and the Holy Spirit convicts you and you say, you know what, that, 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 that one hit me. It is your job to be accountable to God and not hold back and say, you know what, not today. I am not going to do what God wants me to do today. We need to be accountable to each other, to be honorable to God. We are not another institution. We are not a business. We are God's family. 
And when we are God's family, we have one thing unique to each and every one of us, and that's the Holy Spirit of God that lives within each and every one of us. We are accountable to God. We need this. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. You know, if, if any church would take that verse, be humble. In other words, don't be arrogant. Just because you're more knowledgeable about something doesn't mean that you're spiritual. Just because you know something doesn't mean that you're better. It says, be humble, be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults. Now, the Bible also says, you shall know your disciple if you have love one for another. The biggest job of the church is to communicate the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The second job of the church is to evangelize and to disciple. But what we must do is when we go into these walls and we go out and we communicate, somebody will disagree with you. They did not love Christ, but Christ loved them. They beat up and they murdered our Lord Jesus Christ. They are going to beat you up emotionally, maybe even physically, but what we must do is we must show love in all areas. We may not agree with them doctrinally. We may not even agree with them socially. But what we must do is we must love them spiritually because the love of Jesus Christ that lives within us must be loved out. Amen. Encourage. If we do not have accountability, authenticity, what happens is we just encourage mediocrity. We, the church, we are not going to perform better than the concert at trust, in Trust Arena. We are not going to be better comedians than some concert. Our music is not going to be as good as a rock band concert. Our job is not to compete with the world's entertainment philosophy. Our job is to worship and honor God. And when we worship and honor God, and we have a pure heart, and we are not arrogant, we are not prideful. We do show love one for another. We do show people that although you make mistakes, although you may not know everything, that we love you. We walk beside you. We may confront you. If you're living in sin and hurting you, we must confront you in a loving, kind way. But that is just because we want God to work within your life. We can't stick our head in the sand. We must lift your head up and love and work within your life. And we all have heard the team concept, team, together everyone accomplishes more. When we are committed as a church, as we are committed to God at this church, what we will do is we'll say, you know what? My life, my spiritual life, I'm committed to the body of Christ. Now, we need to make something very clear here. You're committed to God. And you're committed to your family. I just happen to have the freedom and God's calling to be the coach of the team. I have great responsibility as the coach of your team. See, the teammates, you guys have that camaraderie. You guys play and work and do things together. My job is to develop the plan, the game plan, if you would, the strategies, if you will. But when we get out on that field, guess where the coach is? The coach is on the sidelines. The coach is sending players in. The coach is sending players out. The coach is making tweaks along the way. The coach is training kids on the sideline. He's not in the game. What we must do is we must look at the team and the commitment of this church and say, you know what, I am committed. First and foremost, committed to God. I don't want to ask you to be committed to this church if you're first and foremost not committed to God. We are committed to one body, one spirit, and one Lord, even one baptism. We are accountable to one for another. But what happens on that last pillar? That last pillar is results. If we have trust in the body, if we can deal with conflict and not take it personal. See, the problem is conflict is not negative. Conflict is dealing with issues. And we have a commitment 
and we're accountable, then the last is when we're going to see the results. We're going to see the results. You know, every church and every family has dysfunction. So dysfunctional teams are always in chaos and feel they have no ability to have victory in any area of their life. But functional churches strive to win, knowing we are serving a bigger picture than ourselves. It's not about me getting the last shot of the game. It's about the team winning at the end of the game. When we look at our success or our failure, what we have to do is, are we dysfunctional or are we functional? Dysfunctional churches lose achievement-oriented volunteers. If we're dysfunction, we lose volunteers. They don't ask me. They won't let me do it my way. So we lose. They go someplace else. If we're dysfunctional, we can't keep those individuals that love the passion of Christ. But functional teams attract and invest in new teammates that in the most cases are willing to do things different than it was done in the past. And we always have to remember, different isn't bad. Different is different. We have deacon board meetings um, every month. And um, at the end of every meeting, matter of fact, we have one today, as soon as I get done. Um, at the end of every meeting, we discuss the issues that we have to discuss. At the end of every meeting, we go around the room, and each one of the nine deacons, um, they have an opportunity to say, do you have anything to add? And if there was an issue or somebody called them or there was something that took place, they would bring up that issue and we talk about those issues. And there are plenty of times where uh, those nine guys say, Bruce, you're not going to like this, but I'm wanting to do this. And, you know, they feel like they're putting a lasso and I'm wanting to do this. They say, you know, that really doesn't work. Here's the issues why. So they're bringing me in. And, and I, say, I say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. They said, Bruce, let's, let's talk about this. So I cannot take it personal when something takes place that I don't necessarily like or I want to do something that doesn't get done. What we must do is we are a team. We are a team and we must strive for focus. So dysfunctional encourage team members to focus on their own individual goals. But functional churches encourage them to stay focused on the main objective, the task in front of them. Dysfunctional churches, they stagnate and they fail to grow. Stagnate. You know, there's always ebb and flow of a church. And the ebb and flow of the church is there's some great days and there's some stagnated days. And when it's stagnated, when, the, when we feel like it's not doing exactly what God wants it to do, when we feel like that we're not growing the way God wants us to grow, if we are trusting each other and we're committed to each other, what we do in those times, we open up our eyes and we see what can we do? How can we grow? How can we fix the issue? And as a church, when we're committed to each other, when we see the times of stagnation, the time that we feel like that we're not just taking off, we don't feel like God is doing everything within our life that we want him to do, we must look at it as a committed church and say, what can I do? How can I get involved? There should be nothing this church can't do. When we have our fall festival, there shouldn't be less than 300 individuals saying, what can I do to serve our community? When we went to Cessna, we had a great turnout in Cessna. Whenever something takes place, we're not asking you to be busy seven days a week. But you know what? Guess what? Sunday is the Lord's day. It's not the Lord's hour. I'm going to give God my tip. No. No. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for my sins, he's my eternal destination is heaven, and I have sacrificed for him because he loves me, what I can do is I can just worship him and love him. What we must do is God put God where he needs to be. You know, churches, every church, just like every home, has dysfunction. But when the Bible says it is calls us like a family. We must be humble. We must not be arrogant. We must be patient. We must take people where they are spiritually. We must love them to grow through maturity. We can't, after a meeting, go around somebody's back. We can't 
hurt somebody. We can't talk bad about somebody. What we must do is we must have face-to-face -face meetings. If somebody is hurting, let's face-to-face. -face. Let's talk to them. Let's encourage them. Because not everybody's on your page. Not everybody's been to church for 30 years. Sometimes people come to church and the first time they've been in church in 20 years and they're scared to death just to walk in the doors. What we must do is we must love them. I may not be able to communicate to everybody on every sermon, but let's be patient. There's going to be a sermon that's going to be for you, but this one may not be for you. But if we're committed to God, we're committed to Him, we're going to see the results that God wants because we are focused on Him. Paul is telling us in Ephesians chapter 4, church, you are different. The only way the world is going to see the church in a different light than any other organization or any other institution is if the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit power of God, the supernatural abilities that God has put upon our life is relevant within the church. And the normal people will come into church and they become supernatural. Not because they're good at business. No, because they're good at following God. And God blesses them. He empowers them. And the spiritual gifts that he has given to them is exposed in the body of Christ. And the gifts that God has given to you are utilized in the body of Christ, supernaturally blessed by God. That's when the world is going to see something uniquely different about the church. It's because the church is not yours. The church is God's. And he put us together. For a time like this, to change the eternal destiny of people that are lost and going to hell. And if a church is dysfunctional, what they're going to do is look at each other. Gripe about the music. Gripe about the preaching. Gripe about the times. Gripe about the chairs. Gripe about the color. Guess what? We need to gripe about Satan kicking our booties because we're self-absorbed with ourselves. What we must do is get our eyes off of each other. Get our eyes off of ourselves. And get alone with God and say, God, what can I do to honor you and to love you? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we love you. And Lord, this is your family. This is your church. And Lord, I pray right now that you will honor us. We need that supernatural power from upon high upon each and every one of our lives that we can serve you. We can honestly go before you in the front of the church and we can say, trust me. If there's conflict, let us deal with the conflict, but let us be committed and accountable because we want you to have the results. We want you to honor us in every area of our life. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for loving us and dying for us. We thank you for giving us the word of God to instruct us in the church. Lord, allow us, give us the ability to forgive. Give us the ability to stay humble. Give us the ability to minister in a way that we are not judging, we are loving. That the body of Christ, this church, will be a, a vehicle of, of salvation because we are a vehicle in order and allowing you to be in charge and allowing you to grow. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Allen.